launching our young adults with grace and presence. And I picked those two words. They seemed the most relevant for the um, adventure. So I do these informal group coaching sessions occasionally, and my intention for them is to have them be informal and interactive and fun. So I hope that some of you will want to get coached along the way and that those of you who can and aren't driving will leave your um, video on just because it makes it more fun for people to get to know each other if that works for you and um, wherever you might be. And we will get started. So I'll start by introducing myself because I think there's a number of people here tonight that I don't know. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is um, clearly a timely topic for the fall. And many, many people are launching children into whatever new launching ground they may be heading off to. And I think that um, given COVID and how things have been, there is a lot more um, parental worry and stress about it perhaps than in the past. Although um, maybe not, maybe there's always tons of parental worry and stress. And so my hope tonight is just to share some mindful parenting tools and coaching strategies and do a little bit of coaching and have some fun and have us all feel a little um, more grounded and more connected and more present and moving forward with some mindful intention and grace. So I am Jesse Mahoney and I am a certified life coach. I'm also a mindfulness teacher and a yoga teacher and I run something called Pause and Presence, and we'll talk a lot about Pause and Presence as it definitely applies to launching our children. And I do one-on-one um, -on -one coaching and group coaching, and I do wellness retreats, and several of you here have come to some of those. And I also teach yoga most Saturdays, and it's free, and I would love to have any of you come. A lot of the same themes that I talk about in parent coaching apply to yoga, they apply to burnout, they apply to transitions, it all applies to everything because that's life. Um, I also am a board certified pediatrician and I worked at Kaiser for 20 plus years in um, both primary care and the hospital. And I run, um, I co-host the Mindful Healers podcast and there are a lot of podcasts on parenting with presence. And so for those of you who want some more of these tools or whose children might not quite be launching, or um, there are just tips in there in many of the parenting episodes that will come up tonight and also have come up in other episodes. So I encourage you to check those out and some of the others as well. And what I consider my best qualification for this evening is that I have um, three sons, two of whom I've launched. One is 26 and is um, engaged and getting married. And one is 22, who just graduated from college and moved to New York two weeks ago. And um, I still have one more to launch. So I still have work to do on myself and launching him well. It's never a done process is what I will offer. So um, I began launching as I thought about this in 2014 is when I sent my first son to college. And I have been launching at least every four years since then because my kids are spaced about four years apart. My last one's a little farther. And what I've noticed is that we launch our children and then we relaunch them and then we relaunch them. And we think that the first time is the hardest. And then um, as it turned out for my middle son, the second time was the hardest because of all the thoughts that I had about it, which is fascinating. And um, so I think that a lot of the work comes around what we're thinking and what's going on in our own brain about it. And so we'll talk a bit about that as well. So I did ask my two children who I launched, for better or worse, what I did well and what I could have done better. And they noticeably didn't tell me what I could have done better, which might um, be a clue that they're, they don't want me to be upset. I don't know. But I appreciated their comments and I thought them to be true. And so um, overall, they said I had done a good job, which I appreciated. But um, one thing that they brought up in my parenting along the way were my high expectations, but what they pointed out that actually my high expectations super helped them out when I launched them and that I um, was very clear about my expectations of graduating in four years and that was what I was going to pay for and they better figure it out and plan it and make sure it worked out and if they needed help to ask me up front. And I, I pretty much had the expectation that they would figure it out and take care of it. And so a lot of that comes down to trust, which in retrospect, they appreciated. They also appreciated the fact that I let them make mistakes and figure it out. 
and that they now more than their friends know how to do laundry. They all know how to cook. They all know how to have jobs and all of those things. And I actually was wondering if they were going to criticize me for that. But what they pointed out was that it was super, super helpful. And they're the ones out in the world that people come back to asking for support. And so um, I think that we often hesitate in trusting and we hesitate in thinking they can figure it out. And so really giving our children that trust can be a really powerful and empowering tool for them. So um, they did also appreciate that I did show up and help them, at least one of them move in. I helped both of them move in actually, but one of them commented on it, which I thought was funny because I don't remember it being a special thing, but he apparently really appreciated that. So I think this is the one who's just moved to New York. And I think it's in contrast to the fact that I put him on a plane to New York with his suitcases and he had to figure it all out when he got there. And so he very much appreciated the help the first time around. And that's probably where the comment came um, because this time he literally had no bed when he arrived and had to figure it out. And I will be proud to say that two weeks later, he has a bed and a couch and some silverware and some food and he's figured it out. And so I do think that when we let them figure it out, they learn so much from that. So I do a lot of coaching on um, parenting and parenting with presence is what I like to call it. And the reason that I like presence is that we show up as high achievers with all kinds of other agendas, but we often don't show up with just presence and just being there. And that's often what our kids need most, especially as they are figuring it out. I like to infuse mindfulness into it because mindfulness is first of all, synergistic with a lot of the coaching work. And when we are um, mindful, we can be more present and we can connect better. We can love better. And a lot of that agenda sort of floats away. And that's where the time with our children becomes so much more meaningful. And you actually get to see who they are and create space essentially for them to bubble up and emerge as who they are. And I'm guessing that many of you are kind of high achievers. I know lots of people here are doctors. And so we tend to show up always the one in charge. And in this role, actually letting our kids take charge can be really uh, super powerful for them. So, and when we are not stressed, there's much more room for them to figure it out. And we are more able to change and they are more able to change. Inherently, I think launching our children can be stressful, but you can also reframe it and come up with other thoughts. It can be fun. It can be an adventure for everybody. There's so much in it that could be reframed if we choose um, to do that. So the other thing I like to throw into all my parenting is that in my opinion, and none of, none of nothing I'm gonna share tonight is medical advice, even though I'm pediatrician, because this isn't anything they teach you in medical school. Um, it's really um, much more coaching mindset and mindfulness and um, parenting advice. So mindful parents, in my opinion, are better parents. And one of the things I learned is in yoga teacher training for kids is that the most important thing we can do for parents of young kids is to teach them to meditate. And I think that's probably true for teenage parent, parents of teens and parents of young adults as well. So that when we can show up present and without an agenda, it creates space for our children to grow into wherever and whatever they um, need or want to do. So... I would encourage you to meditate a lot when your children are young adults, because you're going to have lots of very different opinions that are, they probably are better off unsaid and meditated upon instead. So I often talk about pause and presence, and I think that the pause is where your power is. And so when you pause rather than react immediately, that can be the thing that really allows the whole relationship to shift and for you to find that connection. And so there's that famous Viktor Frankl quote about the space between stimulus and response is where our control and power lie. And that's the pause. And then you get to choose in the pause how you want to show up. So we'll talk a lot today about what we're going to do in the pause. And I'm going to give a bit more of an introduction and then we'll hopefully do some a little bit of mindfulness. And you just mute. This one first, and we'll keep going. So the other thing that I talked about last time I did a, a session was on transitioning well. And I think parenting is all transitions. And so we think of this as like the biggest, most huge transition, but really parenting is a series of transitions. And I think thinking about this as just one of the many transitions can be super helpful because we give it so, so much weight. 
And if this is just one of the transitions, then your child might transition back to live with you. I know I did not, was not necessarily up for that, um, but I think that that can happen. Your child um, may come back and then leave again, or maybe you have a relationship with them as a young adult, and then they get engaged and are getting married, and that's a different transition, and then they become a parent, and that's a transition. And so I think as parents, many people think they're leaving and they're gone, and I would consider this to be just one of the many transitions that have happened along the way, similar to when they launch to kindergarten or launch to high school. And so we use Use this phrasing, and I think that it can actually cause us and them more stress. And so this is just the next phase, or one of the things I like to talk about in relationships is the next season of parenting. And these four years are going to look like something else, and then the next four years are going to look like something else. And so it isn't like the end of something as we know it, because that um, leads us to a, just a lot more drama, as I might um, call it. So the other background I want to give to this is that many of you, like me, are probably high achievers, and a lot of the things that we bring to our lives as high achievers, we bring to our parenting, and they serve us both well and not well, and I think it's helpful to call some of these things out. So some of them are our high expectations, and the idea of thinking about these is just to notice where they help us and where they don't help us, and we can use them intentionally. We also don't like uncertainty, and there's a ton of uncertainty when you're launching your children out into the world. And so just acknowledging that this is going to bring up that dislike of uncertainty and the not knowing. We also love, most of us, to be in control. We like to fix things, and we like to plan. And I see lots of people planning ahead for all the things they're going, kids are going to need all fall. Um, and from my experience, you can send them with lots of first aid kits, and they will never open it. Perhaps the other people in the dorm might enjoy some of the Band-Aids, but pretty much like we think that we're doing it, just know that you're doing it for yourself. Um, and the lesson actually might be even um, better learned by help, having them figure out how to go to student health and how to get some of those things by themselves and go to a drugstore. And so knowing that we like to control, fix, and plan and prepare for the worst, but that that brings with it an edge and emotion and energy to the situation. And so just deciding how much of that you wanna bring into this. Um, with purpose and intention can be very helpful. We tend to be worriers and anxious. And so just knowing that that's our, our backdrop and we tend to look at the negative and what's gonna go wrong and catastrophize about things. And so just allowing ourselves to know that that's what we're bringing to it. We tend to not like mistakes and we tend to think mistakes are bad. And for those of you in medicine, mistakes generally are bad, but they're not necessarily bad for young adults, but it's hard for us to let them make mistakes. And it's hard for us to let them be vulnerable and be vulnerable ourselves. And so just understanding that we're bringing that to the launching. We tend to have a scarcity mindset. And so that adds into our thoughts about um, ultra preparing in advance, which doesn't mean you don't need to ultra prepare, but I think just realizing how your scarcity mindset is coming into play. And the scarcity mindset also brings up that there's no more time and there's not enough time and they won't have time to talk to us and we'll never see them again. And all of these things about how our lives are gonna change forever, et cetera. And so just acknowledging that perhaps we can bring a little bit more of the abundant mindset to the situation and that might change it. We tend to not like discomfort and discomfort is, um, we think of discomfort as a problem that needs to be fixed. And so launching brings up tons of discomfort. And if you just realize it and you can decide what you wanna do with all this later, but knowing that that's coming into play as you approach this launching. And then the last one I wanted to bring up here, and there are tons of other thought patterns, is urgency. We have a high level of urgency. And so we bring a high level of urgency to the moving into dorm rooms. Um, and I remember this with my first son in particular, and a high level of urgency to what they might not have and what needs to be done and to the timing of it all. And so just realizing that that's our tendency and that while in medicine, a lot of things are urgent. Perhaps in, in launching and drop-offs, there's lots of time for them to adjust to it. There's lots of time to figure it out. And whatever problems that may come up in the beginning, there's time for those too. And so approaching these thought patterns with uh, mindfulness and presence is what I recommend. And so thinking about the presence, it's just noticing them without judging them, because we will then judge ourselves for having a scarcity mindset or for catastrophizing. And and noticing also that our kids probably have some of these too, because they've lived with us for 18 years. And so they've watched and they're what we're modeling, they're seeing. 
So mindfulness offers the idea of showing up without judgment, showing up curious, showing up non-striving, which for most of us is really difficult, um, showing up patient and showing up with gratitude slash appreciation is the version that I like to do. And so I think just thinking about some of those main tenets of mindfulness and how can they help you show up for this with presence? Because when you look back five or 10 years from now, you'll want to be proud of how you showed up and you'll want to say, oh yeah, I did that pretty well. And so thinking about now, you can ask yourself that question. What would my future self wish I had done as I was sending my son off into the world and, or my daughter off into the world or what, whoever you're sending off into the world, what will you wish you had done knowing that it's likely going to turn out fine? Because I think our brain goes into what if it doesn't turn out fine, but it's likely going to turn out fine. So in five years, if it's turned out fine, how will you wish you showed up for it? What will you wish you had done? Will you wish you had had more fun? Will you wish you'd gone out to more dinners? Will you wish you spent more time at Target? Whatever it might be, um, just allow yourself the grace to pause and think about that. So the other thing that we all bring to this situation is love. And for those of you who have worked with me before, I always ask this question, what would love do? And I think for launching, it's, it's an amazing question. And it really opens your mind up to how you could show up with grace and presence. And so I would suggest that you think for a moment, if you asked yourself, well, what would love do around whatever launching you happen to be um, approaching? What, how would that help you show up for it? And what might love do? You can share it in the chat box if you want, just so other people can see it. It makes it kind of fun and um, interesting. And I will tell you as you're thinking what I think of when I think what would love do. So I say love would ask, how do you want to show up for this with love? Love would show up with perhaps curiosity or wonder and abundance rather than catastrophizing and scarcity and what could go wrong and focusing on the tasks and the actions. Love would also focus on what's in your control because I think we like to try to have our kids prepare and pack on our agenda. And I will tell you, hopefully my 22 year old never listens to this, but the night before he left for New York, um, he had this office that I'm working in and it was full from one floor to the other of all of his stuff and nothing was packed. And he had to be at the airport at 5 a.m. And when I went to bed at 10, not one thing was packed. And I was like, this is gonna be interesting. And I got up in the morning, he had set his alarm at three and it was all fixed. It was all packed except for some stuff that didn't fit. And he only had room, he was you know, flying on a plane. So that's what he had. And he was like, okay, I'm ready. And it was all I could do to not speak up. But I think most of us would say that you shouldn't do that. And he arrived there and he did regret a few things that he left behind that I had mentioned he might want like a blanket, but that's okay. He went and bought one and he figured it out. And so I do think that, and he's the one who told me that I had done a really good job. So I think that not saying things like we often just feel like we have to, and we know better. And I remember being told, you know, well, I did it wrong. And so this is how you should do it. And I think that letting them figure it out is really, really empowering for them. And we want them to be empowered when they arrive and wherever they end up. And so love would focus on what's your, in your control, which is you. And so for me, that was what you do and what you say and the tone in which you say it. I did say you might want a blanket when you get there, but he ignored me and I let that go. And the other thing is sort of your behavior, because I could have come in and said, let's pack together. <laughs> that would not have gone well. Um, in fact, he said to me, this is how I like to do it. And I thought, oh, like, I don't know. And it turned out fine. So I think that um, he might pack earlier next time. I'm not sure. You know, I think he was exhausted when he got there, but that's fine. I mean, we have to let them figure out their own way. And I think many of us really struggle with that. And so I just want to offer that grace and presence lets them mess up. It lets them figure it out. Um, there is a way to fix almost all of this. You know, my thought is we have to keep them out of danger and that's really what we can do. And tell them our advice. It doesn't mean you don't say things, but you say it and you kind of detach from the outcome. So it's what you do and what you say and the tone with which you say it. It's also how you choose to think and feel about it. And so you get to choose to show up for this with grace and presence. And that's what I offer to you because to me, that feels good. You might pick a different word. Like maybe you want to show up calm or maybe you want to show up centered or grounded, or maybe you want to show up with love. That one I love. Um, and, and you can pick. And 
what I really want to offer here is that love would set an intention. And so I always try to set an intention. And as a yoga teacher, that's something that we do. So if an intention is essentially a wish or an aspiration or a directionality, setting your GPS. So if you don't set one, you're just going to be reactive to the whole thing. And so what is the intention with which you want to drop your kids off or launch them? Is it with love? Is it with grace? Is it with presence? Is it with something else? There isn't a right answer, but you want to figure out what it is for you. And so I like to think of it as a feeling rather than a goal. I want to make it all turn out okay, but what's your feeling? How do you want to show up? And then what do you want to model? Um, and so I've mentioned in a few of sessions like this before, actually mod modeling vulnerability. So you don't have to hold it all together. You also don't want to be like a mess. So maybe elegant vulnerability is a phrase I like to use. Um, you want to model problem solving. So you don't have to have it all figured out and planned out, but teach them how to problem solve by problem solving yourself. And then a couple of others that I think are really helpful here are trust and respect and connection. And so I like to ask the question, what would trust do or what would respect do? And I think the other key thing for those of you who've done coaching, there's a concept called the manual. And the manual would essentially say that if you want them to trust you, you have to trust them. If you want them to respect you, you have to respect them. If you want them to feel, if you want them to connect, you have to connect. And so I think that oftentimes we don't think about our role in it and that's getting back to what's in our control. And so I would encourage you to just think about that if you want. So on my list are trust, respect and connection. And so that's why I shared those. But I think that, um, you know, we often want our kids to trust us, but then we don't show up trusting them. And so realizing that here it's kind of a dance. And so how can we show up with intention for that um, dance? So a couple other thoughts are cleaning up your own mental clutter, which are all those things I said in the beginning. So if you're showing up with scarcity, just know that that's your tendency. If you're showing up catastrophizing, know that that's your, your tendency. And so I love the idea of operating from love and not fear, for example, or showing up with love rather um, and abundance rather than scarcity or hope and possibility. So pick a word that it feels very spacious and open to you. And it might seem silly, but these words in the moment when you're kind of in just all of it can be really helpful. Oh, right. I was going to show up with possibility. What does that look like? And then you can ground yourself and find a path forward that feels more aligned. Um, and again, I think pausing and taking some deep breaths is the other really key thing here because we get off track. Um, I'm the pediatrician. So toddlers get off track. Adults get off track. Young adults get off track, teenagers get off track. And so you can course correct if you pause and just notice how much you may be reacting rather than responding or choosing with intention how you wanna move forward. So a couple of other strategies just around getting out of these thought patterns would be, um, and I mentioned a couple, but thinking about parenting a season. So this is one season. You get many more seasons as it turns out. It goes on. Think about your own parents are still alive. So this parenting relationship doesn't end when you launch them off to college. It's just different. In fact, from my experience, it's almost better. It's fun. It's different. You get a whole new relationship. And so maybe just being curious and deciding that there's many seasons ahead. There's no scarcity. There's no urgency. They get, we're all going to figure it out over time. And that parenting is a long game. And so again, our adult relationship with our children, hopefully, if we are all there living a long time and we're living a long time is way longer than 18, the first 18 years. And so allowing ourselves that grace of time and not hurrying and not rushing. And then realizing it's their journey. And so we very much think it's about us. This is not about us. It's about them. And so remembering that this is our chance to kind of step back, to let them step in and become who they want to become. And that is leads to the next question, which is what would Grace do? And I think Grace would step back so they can step in and see what how they do it. And if we're in there managing everything, which I will say we do that for us, not for them, um, then they don't get a chance to do that. And so stepping back and giving them space, letting them grow like a garden, right? They can be a weedy garden and they can weed it out and like it'll work itself out. It might not look beautiful in the beginning, but they'll figure it out. And if we don't give them the chance to do that, they don't figure it out. And then um, 
accepting and allowing is something I talk about. Um, you can even accept and not like, but all the feelings on all sides. So they're going to have tons of feelings. You're going to have tons of feelings. And I think we tend to judge them. So I shouldn't be sad or I should get over this sadness or I shouldn't be afraid or I, you know, they shouldn't be anxious or stressed or they should be. And just realizing that all of it, like this is just a time where all the emotions get to come. And that's the awesome part. And that's what makes it fun. And so I found myself um, really surprised by the level of sadness that I felt when I dropped off my second son. I was totally unprepared for it, was not expecting it. And um, I had been kind of looking forward to having him go because he had been living in my office for a month and that was not super convenient. And I thought this is going to be great and he's going to love it. And he's been kind of ready to go. And I found myself super sad. And I, my, our natural human tendency is to want to make it go away. So my coach brain said, oh, start thinking thoughts that don't make you sad. That doesn't work, by the way. But also just allowing it. And that can actually be a beautiful thing, because then I started to remember all the funny things he did as a little kid and all these moments. And so you can it can turn into something beautiful if we don't resist whatever the, the feelings are. And we often want to make the bad feelings go away, but that kind of dampens everything. And we end up in the middle where everything's kind of gray and nothing feels fabulous. And so realizing that those really difficult feelings that you may feel actually also allow you to feel the really good ones. And they're sort of what makes life colorful and fun. And so when our natural tendency is shut it down, shut it down, just allow yourself to not have to shut it down and see what happens. And then looking for abundance is the other one. And so asking this question, like, what if the best part of parenting is still to come? What about the gains of their leaving? Like, we actually don't want them to stay in high school forever. <laughs> we actually really want them to launch. And so realizing that this is a big win for everybody and then celebrating all of it. So I think sometimes people say this is the last dinner and the last this and the last that, but what if it's like a wedding? I mean, you can make it fun. And so I encourage you to try to just have fun with it and celebrate it and enjoy it and use it as a chance to remember all the good moments. I think that we get so fixated on the forward and that this can be an opportunity to really look at your whole relationship and how they've gotten here so far and imagine where they would get. Like there's a lot of fun and play in it. So the last thing that I want to say before we pivot into coaching is just this concept of transitioning well. And I think that launching them is a transition, but all of wherever they're launching to is also a transition. And so in yoga, we talk about how if you don't transition well, you don't end up in the right spot. And so how you handle the whole transition and how you show up for it is really sort of the linchpin for how the rest of your relationship is going to go. And so be the parent that they want in their life later on and the parent that you would want in your life later on. And you're sort of establishing this new adult relationship. And so trusting them and respecting them and connecting with them in that way can be a really um, amazing tool. And that same child who's moved to New York, so he went to UC Berkeley, which is not very far away from me. And so we had an agreement that while he was there, we would really leave him alone because we didn't, he thought it was a little bit too close. And so I will say that now he's moved to New York. I hear from him almost every day. And I literally heard from him once a month, if not once every two months when he lived close. And so it's fascinating that when you get, when they get that space, all of a sudden they can kind of reach out and connect in their own way. And he's not asking me for help. He's just giving me little updates and photos of Central Park and photos of things like that. So I think that it, it is telling again, that when you can just show up with grace and presence, even if you don't really feel that graceful and present underneath, you just trying to channel it as best you can, that then they really have that space. It's the energy that you're bringing to the relationship and they will match that. So those were my thoughts and comments as to places to start. And there are lots of um, blogs on parenting on my website too. Um, they're not all tagged parenting, but you can scan through them. There are a lot about teenagers and finding beauty in the mess and letting go and things like that. And there's just some fun stories and I think different ways to sort of stand back and think about things in a more mindful way. Because when you show up with this grace and presence, not with an agenda, and again, you can pick your own version of grace and presence, it really creates space for 
everyone to show up in the best way that they can. And magic can happen in that space if you let it. So I would love to hear from folks what their takeaways are or what they thought think is most helpful. And then I thought we would do a little coaching if anyone is up for it. So you can, um, if you know how to raise your hand, raise your hand if you wanna get coaching. And if you don't know how to raise your hand, you can actually um, unmute. And if anyone wants to put in the um, chat box what takeaways, anything that they, um, I know some people are driving, that's what's in the chat box. So don't text and drive. Um, Jen, yeah, let me unmute you and we'll jump right in. See if that works. Go for can it. You hear me? I can. Yes, I can. Excellent. Hi. Hi. It's nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm a Bay Area person too. Ah, wonderful. Wonderful. Um, probably saw me. I'm like crying through the whole thing. Um, literally sitting in my living room. I made myself go outside, unpacking bags from Bed Bath and Beyond and Target as we speak, because um, we're leaving in two days to take my kid out to San Diego State. Okay. I took my first kid to college last year, so it's just. Yeah, it's just been a lot. <laughs> you get to keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've been getting a little bit of coaching myself and through the process, trying to show up calm and supportive is sort of the words that I've been mm -hmm. okay. using. Um, but it's really hard. I, it, I have two very different kids. And the second, I just have all sorts of sadness and anxiety that I didn't have at the first. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like you said, you were caught off guard by being yeah. sad. Yeah. I'm so sad. And um, what are you I saying? Have, um, well, I have two different issues. I'm sad just because he's just lovely and <laughs> he's been around a ton because of, you know, the yeah. past, the way the past few years have been. Um, and so we're just going to miss him a lot. Like he's just a lovely presence in our home. And, you know, we joke, he texts us in at night, he comes in and says goodnight to the dog. And he's, I mean, he's just, he's just yeah. lovely. Yeah. Um, but I, and then on the other half of it, I have a ton of anxiety because he's my less social mm -hmm. child mm -hmm. and I'm literally catastrophizing everything. He's not going to make friends. He's not going to talk to people. He's going to be lonely. He's going to be depressed. He's going to, mm -hmm. I mean, it's been, yeah. it's been really out of control my other kiddo was had 40 friends before he went to school mm -hmm. um and and my younger one is not on social media he hasn't connected with anybody mm -hmm. his roommates are like the total opposite mm -hmm. from him what and i want it out to get out fun. of that yeah what if he figures it out and does it his own way he he might he very well might and i'm trying to stop catastrophizing and just be there and just be in the moment and um, it's, I it's think probably going to be fine. It, it's, pro it, you know, well, it's equally likely to be fine as not fine. So maybe you could just get to the equal. Because I yeah. think for you to say like, oh, it's going to be fantastic. That's not, it's too far. And I don't mean this with love, but it's too far of a stretch for it to be fantastic right now. So maybe it can just equally be good and bad. Like in terms of the catastrophizing. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just say like, that might not happen. You don't have to say it's going to be fabulous, right. but it just might not happen just to soften it. And then I think this sadness, it's actually lovely because what if you weren't sad he was leaving, first of all? <laughs> that would be worse. That would be sad in a different way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I actually think that's, I mean, it's the sadness and the worry come because of love. Yeah. Right? And your brain just has more worries about him. Probably always has, right? Yeah. Maybe because he's different than you. I don't know. But mm -hmm. yeah, my other son and I are more alike. Yeah. And so your worries, you just don't know how he's going to do it because it's not how you would do it. And so it's like, this is uncertain for sure, right? This is a part of fear of uncertainty. Like your other child, I don't know if it's boy or a girl, but you you were, you felt pretty good that they were going to figure it out. And in this yeah. case, not so much. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And my first has so far and my second, I think will, but I don't want to be worrying so much that he 
that he thinks that he's not going to be successful. Right. So what if you believe in him because for him? Yeah. Like maybe that could be incentive for you. Yeah. It helps me a lot. And I try, I'm not trying to like hide my feelings. Like he knows I'm sad and that we're going to miss him, but I'm trying to not um, express like my specific worries about him thriving or not thriving because I don't, yeah, I don't want, I don't want Could him you? to also feel that way. Yeah. Could you step back so he can step in? That feels like, like. A little bit of that happened today. Cause like, I don't know, the Monday before class started, he got all these emails about school and things for school. And he started, like he had a piano placement exam and, and it was, that was nice to watch and to see him doing things independently and and him being kind of excited about that side of it. And mm-hmm. I was able to just step back mm-hmm. and watch that. Um, and it kind of made me feel better. Like, yeah. okay, there is part of this that, that he's, he's going to really excel at, which is the school yeah. part. Yeah. Well, and so now I have a little evidence that he can handle some of it. Yeah. What if he surprises you? That would be great. <laughs> I'd be so yeah. glad. <laughs> yeah. And he might, he really might. And I tend, I tend to catastrophize. This is not. Yeah. I think I'm over. This is beyond my normal, but. Well, so why, what story can you tell about the catastrophizing? So part of the question about what would love do, which I didn't mention, is that it's love for you. So I'm here as a mom, loving you as a mom, like, of course she's sad. And of course she's worried. And so like love for yourself would say like, well, I'm going to be worried because this kiddo is different than me. And I don't know how he's going to do it. It's going to, how he's going to do it's totally different than how the other one's going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, that, I don't know. I, I think I really want it to, I want to be able to have these feelings and feel the feelings and show up for him, Mm. you know, and this Mm -hmm. in, in a way that helps him take it on and succeed and be successful. So I have two thoughts, which are, I think you need to allow the feelings, right? Because if you push them down, they're just going to erupt and that won't, won't be pretty. But (laughs) um, you could allow them at certain times, maybe when he's not sitting right next to you, like now, right? You just let them all out and you say, okay, well, I'm going to be sad for an hour today, or I'm going to be sad for two hours today. And then you can sort of carry a little bit with you, but you've let the the sad be there. Um, Mm -hmm. And that, that might actually take the, it's like the Instapot, let the steam off the Instapot. And so that you can then, he's still going to know you're sad. And you're still going to show up crying when you drop him off. But he might just think it's something about you. Like your story also is that he will know that you think maybe he's at higher risk, but he probably just thinks that his mom's a little bit off her, off her game right now. Like all she's doing is crying. Why is that? I don't even understand. Um, And so you could sort of frame it in whatever story you want. He, I think another big difference is my first son was so excited to go Mm -hmm. and my second son is showing some anxiety and some worry. Mm -hmm. And so that fuels my. Uh, So this is perfect because you are showing some anxiety and some worry. And so you can show him, this is one of the things we talk about in terms of vulnerability, show him what you do with anxiety and worry and how can you use it and how can you not let it take over and sort of use it in a way that's productive and or not use it in a way that's productive, but just not let it like take over. And so um, it's like you have anxiety and worry and he has anxiety and worry and nothing's gone wrong. That's actually expected when you go to college. And that's what I say to him. Those are the words that come out of my mouth. Yeah. But you don't feel you know, it. Of course, of course you're worried. Yeah. You know, and this is a lot and it's different and, mm-hmm. but you know, we're here for you and, and, and then I cry, you know, not with him as much, yeah. but mm-hmm. Yeah, well, but that's I do helpful. think letting him know that you are anxious and worried. 
And, and not because you think he can't succeed, but that's just goes with the territory of going. So if he's anxious and worried, it also doesn't mean he can't succeed. It's just part of going to college. And I think the other thing is if you have one child who's super excited, you can just say like, well, some people are super excited. There's at least as many people who are anxious and worried. They just don't, they're not the ones, you know, celebrating in the hall. They're the ones who are anxious and worried. And so normalizing that some kids are anxious and worried and some kids are excited and some kids are terrified and some kids decide not to go and some kids can't wait to go. Yeah. I told him also, I said that I, I said, just because your brother like never called us, Mm -hmm. like everybody goes to college a little bit differently. You know, my girlfriend's daughter calls her every day. I said, I'm not saying you have to call me every day. But mm-hmm. it doesn't have to, you don't have to model this after what your brother did because you and your brother are different. Yeah. And if you need to reach out more, we're here. Just, yeah. just kind of to put it well, out I there. Wonder, right? Just as lovely as he is to have at home, he might be lovely to live in a dorm room. Like maybe not his roommates or maybe his roommates, but maybe there'll be some other people that will just really enjoy his sort of presence. He's a cool kid. They should. <laughs> yeah, they should. Yeah. But can you ground into that, that he's, that's part of why you're sad, because he's super cool. Yeah, no, I love that, for sure. I think the other thought I have is, and I don't know if this will be reassuring or not, but it's reassuring to me that like, college is not everyone's panacea. Not everybody loves college. And like some of the coolest people who have like the most successful lives, they don't love college. And I think in our mind, you have to go and you have to love it. It has to be great. And you have to, doesn't mean that he won't get exceptional grades and end up somewhere or not even exceptional grades, but end up in a, a gorgeous, amazing place in life. Yeah. But he doesn't have to love it. Well, and I had to remind myself that for the past three years, he's been happy in his room. Like he's been happy in his room. Like he's content. He's not unhappy. And just because my idea is that he needs to be off doing X, Y, or Z, like he likes to build Legos and play music and, Mm -hmm. you know, play the piano. And and so my expectation too is based on what I would need, not what Mm -hmm. he would need. And so I've been really working on that shifting, like realizing who he is and that's different than who I am yeah, and who my other son is. And And also what if, like, what if, San Diego state turns out terrible and he comes home and he ends up going somewhere else. Like his life is still going to turn out fine. Would be my guess. I think our brain is like, this has to work. Say he goes for, I don't know if it's a semester or quarter and he comes home in the holidays and he's like, that's just not the place for me. Yeah. No, but that's okay. Yeah. Kudos to him actually for figuring that out. Right. Yeah. I'm okay with that piece of it. I think just want him to have a friend. (laughs) Yeah. What do you think the chances are that he'll have one friend? I think they're pretty good. It might take a little while. Mm -hmm. And that has to be okay. But I'm pretty sure he'll have a friend. And you just told me he's okay hanging out in his room. (laughs) So he might, you wouldn't be okay with it out of friend for one day, right? Right. He might be okay. He's probably going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And really cool thing is these days uh, we were talking to my kids that when I went to college, like we had to go to the payphone and sit on the floor and like hold the thing. And it cost like hundreds of dollars to call your parents. And now you can just FaceTime them whenever you feel like it. Uh, I know I, I said the same thing. Cause I had like the phone. I was like, you know, that actually has a cord that <laughs> attached to the wall. And then I went, I would stretch it out into the hallway and yeah. Very different. So it, there are a lot of things that hopefully will make it easier. And again, I think just for you, like grace actually would allow all the feelings and would sort of show him how to handle lots of feelings. And that's probably a useful lesson. I mean, you don't have to be a mess, but you can yeah, the feelings out or you can be a mess. Like he'll always remember you being a mess when he went off to college and that'll be okay. It's tough. My mom was such a mess and I don't want to be as much of a mess. So I'm trying to okay. find a different, slightly different space. What but if that's why it's happening? You come by it rightly. That probably is a big part of it. <laughs> Which is not no, non-judgment here. That's what I'm saying. And non uh, like, you don't have I, to be awesome. I judge it a lot and I resist that a lot, but, mm-hmm. but I think it's life. I think it's real. I think that's real. <laughs> What if your goal, this is, and that is to just have a little more grace and a little more presence than your mom did. Yeah. And maybe a little more fun. 
Yeah, and a little more fun. Add that yeah. in. Yeah, and yeah. that is my that's my goal. Yeah, sure. that feels lovely. I love that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Anybody else um, want some coaching? <laughs> you can raise your hand or you can unmute. Everybody's good. I love it. <laughs> Hi, Jesse. It's Maureen. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can't see you, but I can hear you. I don't know where you are, but go for hmm. it. It's um, all good. My, okay, my video is on. Maybe I need to change a setting. Don't worry about it. You're just not on okay. my screen. I, oh, okay. It's fine. Um, I'm sure well, you're there I, somewhere. <laughs> Um, I don't want to take anyone else's opportunity for coaching. So please uh, raise your hand or unmute. Um, if no one else wants to share, then I'll go ahead and say why I'm here. Um, so my name's Maureen Park. I'm in Oakland, California. I'm an OBGYN and I'm actually not a parent. Um, I don't have any kids. I'm 48 years old. I happen to be an active auntie to my um, nephews. Uh, Daniel is 15 and Matthew is 12. And I wasn't planning on participating with this particular group because I thought, okay, well, it's launching with presents, parenting. But then I got the email saying, well, this group is starting now. And I said, well, hey, I'll join. <laughs> and, um, and the reason I thought this was appropriate was, um, so yesterday I gave 15 year old Daniel a driving lesson in my 2005 Prius. I mean, he loves that car. He grew up in this car. He just like, we've gone to Disneyland in this car when he was four years old. He's a rising sophomore at Bishop O'Dowd High School. Um, and in a year he'll turn 16 and he wants to use this beater car as his like first car. Mm -hmm. And it, you realize like, it's all, it, it seems like it's going by in a blink. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in a year he'll be driving in a couple of years, maybe, you know, he'll probably go to college. And it also brings up memories of um, when I went to college um, I'm a caregiver to my 83 year old mom. I'm, I'm living with her right now. So I'm an, a live in caregiver. And all this conversation that Jen Holden shared about her mom's reaction when she went to college and her reaction when her first son went to college and you know her second son is on the cusp of going to college. Um, it just brought up a lot of um, great thoughts and memories and joys and um, intense emotions. So I just wanted to say thank you for this. Um, I don't know if I have a particular question or coaching request, um, other than this session has been delightfully appropriate for an active auntie. I love it. And actually, I think, you know, you will be an auntie when he launches and comes home and all of those things. So I love that. And I think that all of these tools, they're actually appropriate for any transition and any, um, you know, all kinds of things that pop up. Priya, go ahead and. Um, Let's see if I can unmute you. Hi, um, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Hi, uh, so I'm, um, I'm from Austin, Texas. I'm an oncologist. Um, so this is my first time listening into one of your uh, hey. sessions. It seems really awesome. Um, I just have a question because I struggle with a lot of parenting things, but <laughs> I think one of my biggest, um, biggest issues has been uh, with my oldest son who, um, he started college last year and mm -hmm. he'll be um, moving out of the dorms into the apartment this year. And he, um, he's a very, very bright boy um, on the spectrum, lots of social issues. And I have struggled big time with him not wanting to have a bond with me or like, or at least my view of a traditional bond. He, doesn't want to um run, he doesn't want me to interfere in his life ever like mm -hmm. he's very I feel uh generally very much of an introvert which is mm -hmm. okay bothers me more than him but right um but and he just doesn't let me know about anything that goes on like I he never um like I don't know anything yeah. you know about school college I never did and um, like there was, um, some incidences on campus, like, you know, um, with, um, robberies and, um, like lots of like, uh, major things like, you know, legal stuff and like right next to his dorm. And, you know, I think a lot of kids' parents knew, and I didn't know, 
Um, and I was like, you know, at least the very least, I just want to know you're safe. He just, he just can't be bothered, you know? It's like, he doesn't want me to be part of anything. It's very yeah. different from my other two kids. My, my middle son's going to college, the same college. And I'm not worried about him, even though he's like super young for college. Like he just turned yeah. 17, you know, but he's a social kid. I don't worry about him. But with my oldest, I always worry that, you know, how, like the lonely kids are always like, you know, probably like, I don't know what worries me so much, but. Yeah, well, I think um, probably because you don't understand it. So he doesn't handle it the way that you said he was a little, he was maybe on the spectrum. And, and probably also there's more worries that he won't be able to navigate it well, or he won't know. And perhaps just the uncertainty that you don't know is causing you distress. Yes, and he's he been be. bullied a lot in his lifetime. So I think that bothers me because yeah. I just know that he doesn't know how to handle mm. that most kids in our neighborhood wouldn't necessarily want to hang out with him. He His reaction to things is slightly different. Um, and he, But he doesn't want anybody to know that he's different. Yeah, well, and is there a way? So I think, I mean, he's an adult now, so he's going to handle it the way that he is going to handle it. And you have, you're making whatever he is doing mean something, right? It probably means nothing about you. It's purely, yeah. he's handling it in a way that works for him. Does that make sense? And so to me, the question though is safety and making sure that he's safe and let it be clear about what, you know, what he needs to tell you, or maybe just call every Sunday and you have to ask the questions because he's not going to self-report. <laughs> Right. I asked him, I was like, can we have a scheduled, like just once a week call, like a really short one. I won't take much of your time. And mm -hmm. he's like, if I ever feel the need to talk, I'll call. Mm -hmm. And he never calls, you know, and, um, can you text? Will he text? I've texted him and then he's like, you know, don't bother me. I'm studying, which he's a very hardworking kid. I know he's studying a lot, but, um, it's just like, he just says, Oh, if, you know, we don't, really what is there to talk about if you think about it, right he's not a talker so it doesn't achieve right. his purpose i do think i mean there's a couple ways to think about it he thinks he's fine so right. you're worried because of love and i always say worry is love right or love is worry yeah. like it, they're the same and so on the other hand you want to make sure he's safe and so right. i did my middle child who wouldn't communicate very much even though he is very chatty but he didn't have time to chat with me i would say you know um we had a plan. We'd talk once a week, but that didn't ever happen. So then it was like once a month. And then I would actually text. And if he didn't answer, I would literally like start texting question mark. Let me know you're okay. And then he would respond. And so it was like, and really he was just busy enjoying himself. And he was like, I'm fine. She doesn't need to know I'm fine. Everything is fine. Now, interestingly, he's texting all the time. So I think part of it is just where they are. But I think with him, you need to figure out like, how do you know he's safe or what's the, you know, what's the issue? He might actually be having less bullying in college if he's just doing his work and he's quite smart and he's in his right. space. But I always told my kids I'm paying. And so that requires this check-in not about this often. And like, if you don't respond, I'm going to call you. And if I, you don't respond, I'm going to, you know, and so, right. um, Pretty much, we have a new thing when I do the question mark, I always get a response. Like if I've asked the text twice and they haven't responded, I, I always get a response. And so you might just yeah. ask like, yeah. if he's not thinking he has to meet your needs and all you wanna know is he's okay. You can text, are you okay? He'll probably text back, yes. And that will be it, right? Yeah, 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 you're right. I just think that, I mean, some of it is just that he doesn't think beyond himself and he's right. always been that way, right? right. He doesn't. Mm -hmm care that mom may be worried or you know he has other little brothers who miss him you right. know how about a call or you know something like that I, and I just feel like is it is it uh, is it my fault that I somehow didn't instill that feeling of like compassion towards others and um you don't which have is to always eat lemon rice if you don't want to Jan <laughs> sorry I, my thought is that if he's on the spectrum this is not you I mean and most of what happens with our kids is not us we do the best we can in the moment with the information that you have. And you did gave him the best start and the best background and the love. And really what our kids need is love and they're going to figure it out. I think we often go to the, well, it turned out this way. So I must have done something wrong. 
but it doesn't mean you did anything wrong because as you pointed out, your second son is completely different and I'm guessing you raised them fairly similarly. Right, right. Yeah, well, I mean, he's similar to the uh, the older boy in that, you know, he will also not necessarily communicate a lot, but uh, but I, I know he's more mature. So that's the part I don't worry. I don't worry as much, but I still feel the same guilt as in they don't seem to communicate as much as their friends do with their moms. And I don't know why, why I should compare. I do. Yeah, yeah. Bothers me. Well, that's our compare and despair. But it bothers you, and this is actually the perfect fodder for coaching. It bothers you because you think it means something about you or your relationship. And the uh, good son who was in college would communicate with his mom. Right. right. And if they because don't- Because mom, you know, when they want money, like money, you know, when it's he communicates like Amazon, with money or boom, food, it's right? like right away, you know, there's yeah. no lack of communication when it comes to a need, monetary need. And it's like, I just feel like, am I just there for that? <laughs> well, first of all, that's good. So when they need something or they're in trouble, they do communicate. So I just want to point out that's good. Like, what if they didn't? Then that would not be good. So, right. um, and then it, it's really, they're not communicating love or connection in the way that you think they should. So if yes. you go back to the sort of your manual is that boy children should communicate love in a certain way, either because someone else's boy children do or, or because that's what you want. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that if you, your story too, is that if you parented them differently, they would. Yeah. I'm not sure that that's true, but you could also just realize that you can ask them for what you want. I would like you to call once a week, or as I mentioned the thing about, if you want them to connect, connect, why don't you just call them once a week? Yeah. And I've tried, they just don't pick up the phone or like, you know, my son went on a four day trip with his friends last week. And, you know, there was like, I kept texting him. I was like, Hey, you okay. Did you eat dinner? Like yeah. nothing, not a, but know. what if, what if they need the space? Cause I also wonder if you give them the space, sometimes right. they can reach out. And yeah. you can have some outside limit, like after four weeks, we have to connect <laughs> or, um, you know, but, but maybe giving them a little bit of space because I, I think um, I'm a three boy mom and boys definitely don't communicate as much as girls. They just don't, that's not their thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some, a couple of people in the chat box are, I have three boys and like, they, they just, <laughs> and, yeah, I'm a three, three boy yeah. mom too. So it's just yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I I honestly I don't compare to girl moms at all. Yeah. I know how different it is. I'm like, no way, I can't match that. You know, it's just the other boy moms are like, oh yeah, he called me, he told me everything. It's like, really? But Jen's two boys are totally different. And I have three boys that are totally different. Um, and my son who went to college in San Diego communicated all the time. And my one who went to college in Berkeley didn't communicate at all like and that actually isn't even about their personalities because the one who didn't communicate is the chattier one he was just busy chatting with everybody else not me um and I think initially I thought like well doesn't he doesn't miss us and he doesn't this but if I look at the long game like he was figuring out who he was he was being who he is and that that's sort of his personality and so I could tell a story that doesn't care about me <laughs> and you could all tell the same story right but I'm going to choose to, that that's not true um, and that he was just figuring something out. But I think yeah. it's it's the, our discomfort with not knowing and our, our story that a, kid, a son, and that's your story, a son who goes to college will still call his mom if he loves her and cares about her. Yeah. I remember my mom complaining about my older brother never calling, um, which is interesting. Um, I called all the time. Uh, yeah. But I think... I think every kid, maybe just honoring that that's what they need and telling yourself that story and giving them the space to sort of figure out what, um, what they need and then have a bare minimum for you. Like, well, I need to have lunch or I need to have this, or I don't know how far away they're in college, or we need to talk once a month. You guys pick and, you know, you can hold, withhold some of that food money if they don't do it and just like say like, this is so important that, you know, you have to talk to me. If you want your lunch money, you have to talk. Um, sure. That usually works really well. Yeah. Okay. Sounds um, good, Jesse. Because I don't, yeah, I don't think it's about you. Um, 
And then the other thought I have is just around the, the spectrum stuff, like kids on the spectrum, they just approach things differently. So it's not your, it's him and he's going to be him and you're going to be you and you approach things differently. So just acknowledging that there's a difference there. And it's right. one of my favorite phrases in coaching is it's not about you. It's really, we think it's about us. And for those of you who are doctors, we were told it was about us, right? If we phrased it differently or did it differently, we would be able to extract the proper information. And if we, you know, I'm a pediatrician, if I explained the vaccines better, someone would say yes. Well, that's not always true. Some people are always going to say no. Um, and so I think but we carry that to our parenting. Well, if I did this better, they would be a better student. If I did this better, all of those things. And so it isn't necessarily true. So I think um, just realizing that he is who he is and he his way through college and through like navigating this season is going to be very different, but he may end up being the one who ends up living next door. You don't know. True, true, true. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. So we are um, near time. I did, someone had mentioned just this issue of um, mental health stuff within the context of COVID. And I do think, you know, my personal opinion is giving space is important and allowing ourselves to step back and trust ourselves, but also trusting yourself that if you think there's something wrong or you're really worried, like you don't want to be the parent, you want to always act in a way, ask your future self if you would be proud. So if you're worried about your kid, you actually want to, to pause and say like, well, a year from now, will I wish I had driven up there and checked on them? Or if you really have a sense, I'm the pediatrician who believes every parent who says there's something wrong because they're 99% of the time correct. And so I do think like you do know your children best. And so when, you, when it's not about you, but you have a genuine worry about them, I think it's really important to um, pay attention to that. And to know that, um, I just think that mental health stuff has popped up a lot more given COVID. It doesn't mean that we should add it to our list of worries and catastrophizing. We absolutely shouldn't. But just to know that um, you know your child best. And so if you're worried, you just keep asking and make space for them to be imperfect and a mess and that that can be super, super helpful. So I like to end just with a couple of deep breaths and hand to heart um, because hand to heart is, is really sort of sending yourself love. And most of us, uh, we're willing to send all the love out and all the compassion out to everyone in the world, but we don't give it to ourselves. And realizing that that's a huge piece of the being able to parent with presence and grace is having grace and compassion and presence for yourself. And so... I would offer to just find a comfortable seat wherever you are and connect your sit bones downward underneath you and tilt your pelvis forward and stack your spine and bring your hands directly to your heart space, one hand atop the heart and the other hand atop. And just take in a deep breath through your nose and out through your mouth. And take a couple of long nourishing breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Noticing that with each breath, perhaps you feel more calm and more present and more settled, perhaps more centered. And matching the inhale and the exhale. And I like to consider that even teaching your kid to breathe before they head off is, a, is an amazing tool. Most of us weren't taught how to breathe or to take time to breathe. And noticing as we just breathe together here, being mindfully present, all the energy in our cells and all throughout our body, spinning around, feeling better. And it's a simple tool that can be done anywhere when the anxiety pops up or the emotions pop up. One more breath together. And pressing the heel of your hand into that heart space, releasing a bit of oxytocin. And knowing that when we do hand to heart, studies actually show it lowers the cortisol in your saliva. So giving yourself that gift of less stress and less worry with this simple act of hand to heart. Another option to share with your kids if they're receptive or when they're receptive, whenever that might be. When you're ready, you can lower your hands, open your eyes and come back together. 
Thank you all so much for joining. It was fun and a delight. And um, I would love to see any of you again, work with any of you again. You can join me for yoga on Saturdays and I will be doing another Parent with Presence this fall. So I will let you know when that's happening. And in the meantime, launch your children well, have fun, a little grace, a little presence. Humor is always welcome. And um, show up in a way that you feel proud so that when you look back, even if your kids reflect on it and say you didn't do a good job, you'll know you did. So nice to see you all. Have a beautiful night and I will see you all soon.